morning, church. There's a man who once told his son that if he wanted to live a long life, the secret was to sprinkle a little gunpowder on his cornflakes every morning. So the son did this religiously, and he lived to be 98 years old. When he died, he left 14 children, 28 grandchildren, 35 great-grandchildren, and a 15-foot hole in the wall of the crematorium. <laughs> Power. In May of 1867, a man named Alfred Nobel was granted the patent for his new invention, which was a potent mixture of nitroglycerin and sawdust that when lit demonstrated explosive power. He called it dynamite. Interesting, isn't it, that the man who would one day have the Nobel Peace Prize named after him was the inventor of the most famous explosive substance in the history of the world, dynamite. The word dynamite is derived from a Greek word, word that appears in your New Testament this morning. The word is dunamis. And one of the most well-known uses of it is in a pretty famous verse in chapter 1 of Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where it's written, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The word power is this word dunamis. But today I want us to think more about another place where this word occurs, and it's in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. And so let's read some verses there as we begin. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm going to start reading in verse 17. Paul writes, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Do you realize how confused we all are in this world about power? We really are. Now, worldly people, obviously, are confused. The world lusts after power. They view it as a way to get their way. They view it as a way to control others, to oppress others, to manipulate people, and so forth. And that's reflected here in this passage that we read. Notice 
in what Paul wrote there. There, there are people in his day, um, and there still are in ours, who when they hear about the cross of Jesus Christ, they immediately think weakness. That's the image that comes to them when they think about the cross. They cannot wrap their minds around the idea that the cross of Jesus is really about power. They see a person hanging there who failed, who lost. They equate suffering with failure and loss. Paul writes here that the Jews of his day, for their part, wanted to see powerful signs performed. They wanted Jesus to do signs. They asked him to do so. And that's what they looked for in the one that they were hoping God was sending. The one um, that they hoped would be Savior. That's what they demanded. And sometimes, of course, Jesus did those things. He did those powerful things works not at their request but by his own will and when he did often they ignored them they uh, they refused to believe in spite of seeing him do great works and great signs of power their precious traditions were stronger in them than anything jesus could do because they thought their traditions gave them power and control over people the thing that, that bothered them and threatened them the most was the fact that Jesus was becoming so powerful, so popular and influential with regular people, common folk. And they were losing their control over the crowds. This was a great threat to them. And so when Jesus goes to the cross, this is proof to them that he was not who he said he was. And they mock him there, don't they? We actually looked at those passages in our Bible study time this morning. They say to him, save yourself. Come down from the cross. Totally misunderstanding what's going on. And a total misunderstanding of power. They missed what Jesus was all about, and especially what the cross was all about. They entirely missed it. Well, Paul also talks in this text about Gentiles uh, here in 1 Corinthians 1. It's down in verse 23 again. What is the cross to worldly Gentiles? Well, to them it's foolishness uh, to suggest that dying on a cross was anything other than a terrible punishment justly deserved by a criminal uh, by a subversive to suggest anything other than that was, was just silly to them. It was nonsensical. To say that a man on the cross was doing the most powerful thing that had ever been done in the history of the world, that was something that they would laugh at, that they would make fun of, that they would shake their head at. To them, there's nothing wise were powerful in the cross. But they didn't understand. They didn't understand power. And, and I'm suggesting today that most people still do not understand it. Both people in the world and even some who claim allegiance to Jesus. Let's face it. Many people in our world today still can't wrap their minds around the power of the cross of Christ. Now, I think many would still appreciate seeing some type of sign, some uh, work of power, and, and many ask for a reasonable explanation of, of matters of faith, but the cross, to most, is at best an empty religious symbol. What power could come from such a death? 
And I wonder sometimes if we don't struggle with the same thing. You know, the, the Apostle Paul was dealing with a situation in the church at Corinth when he wrote these words. There's something going on there. And that something seems to be division in the group of believers in Corinth. So Paul calls on them to unite, if you look at verse 10 of that chapter, uh, to be of one mind and so forth. And, and it says that they're arguing with one another in verse 11. And you know what they're arguing about? Who their favorite preacher is. Really, Favorite preacher is a source of division among the believers in the first century at Corinth. And as you read it, it sounds like they preferred whoever it was that had baptized them. Uh, so Paul says in verse 14 that he was glad that he hadn't baptized any of them. Except for two that he names and, and then... He seems to have another group that comes to mind in verse 16. But you see what they were doing. They were putting power in the wrong place. They were putting power in the preacher. And they were emptying the cross of its power as a result. Paul makes a very stark statement in verse 17. That's the first one we read. A moment ago, he says, For Christ did not send me to what? To baptize. What? How dare a preacher of the church of Jesus Christ say that? For Christ did not send me to baptize. How can he say that? He could say it because the Corinthians didn't understand where power was located. It wasn't in Paul. It wasn't in Apollos. It wasn't in Peter. Or any person, you see. The power was in the cross of Jesus Christ. And so I remind us today, beware of devotion to any man. No matter how great, no matter how influential in your own life, beware of devotion to any man. I understand good positive feelings that we might have about a, a person, perhaps a, the person who taught us the gospel. There's nothing wrong with that. I understand even having a favorite preacher, favorite speaker, maybe a favorite writer, but beware of ever being guilty of emptying the cross of Christ of its power. When it comes down to it, as Christians, the cross is what we have. It is what we're about cross. We are a people of the cross. It is our resource. It is our theme. It is our banner. It is our source of hope. It's our inspiration for life. It's our supply of strength. It is our deep well of wisdom. It is our example for living. The cross is our power. If ever in doubt, look at the cross. If you ever wonder where you should go next, go to Calvary. If you're ever mystified over what would move that one person that you've been trying to teach, that you've been trying to to reach, quit wondering, share the cross. That's where the power is. 
They don't need to hear the right preacher. They need to hear the cross of Christ. See, we, we can fall into the same error of the world. Just like Paul talked about here. And, and we can almost make the cross like a religious talisman. A symbol that maybe only has relevance on Sundays. And, and I'm telling you this morning, Scripture is telling us this morning, it has more power than anything else God has ever done. Jesus Christ and him crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to us who are called, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You want to blow up somebody's life? And I don't mean in a bad way. I mean in a good way. You want to blow up somebody's life? You know, uh, when Nobel invented dynamite, he never intended it to be used in many of the ways it ended up being used. Um, he intended it as a tool to help people as they did things like moved mountains or tunneled through places uh, like mountains and so forth. It was a safer form of the ways that those things had ever been done before up to that time. Nobel, it is said, was very disheartened at some of the more violent ways that dynamite came to be used over time. But the cross of Christ has the power, the dunamis, to blow up people's lives today in a constructive way, not a destructive way. When people finally decide to throw out the wisdom of the world, and, and, and this doesn't seem like a hard step. Not very many people convinced that the wisdom of the world is all that great anymore. But when people finally decide to throw out the wisdom of the world, the way they've always reasoned and thought about things and start thinking God's way, it's amazing what the power of the cross can do to transform a person. It is amazing the power of God and what it can do in the life of a person who comes to the cross. Very few of you ever met my mother. If you had, you would know what a quiet, unassuming, gentle person she was. And... Uh, I figure that the world would look at her and call her weak. Uh, she would have called herself weak, in fact. Never in her life did she ever bowl anybody over, never bullied anybody, forced anybody into submission. All those things that the world says demonstrates power. But it's been amazing since she passed several years ago, how many people have talked to us about what a difference she made in their life for the good. And that could take much longer than I have this morning to give you example after example of people saying that and describing it. But if I did that, frankly, she would not be happy. And that really sort of explains the whole thing, if you think about it. The world would say, preacher, if she was so great, show us what you mean. You know, give us a sign. 
Or they might say, explain what you mean. Reason it out. And even a good teacher of preachers would say in evaluating a sermon, they'd say, Mark, you have to be more specific. If you're going to bring your mom up as an example, you have to tell a concrete story to show what you mean. But no. Not in this case. The most important thing about my mother was that she was a woman of the cross. That's where the power is. Never, ever forget that. The cross is the power of God. Well, this morning, as we conclude, we offer you the cross of Christ. If you've never come to the cross and submitted yourself and bowed yourself to the one that's hanging there and given your life to him and obeyed his gospel, if if you've never done that, you have another opportunity yet today to do so to be baptized into Christ and to have your sins washed away. If you've not been living faithful to that calling, if you've tried maybe the power and the wisdom of the world for a while and you figured out once again that's all a mess, you could always come back to the one who died for you. We offer you Jesus and the cross this morning, if we can help you in your response to it in a public way today, let us know. If we can do so in a private time, please let us know as we stand, as we sing.